Okay, Jamie, today I'm going to be teaching you about the Cybermen, their history. Cybermen? Okay, no, we're not going to do that. Well, well we are going to read about the history of the Cybermen, but we're not, we're not going to do it in the characters' voices. The name Cybermen, I may have done this earlier for 10th Planet, but like this episode 3 is missing. I don't know what else to talk about. The name Cyberman comes from cybernetics, a term used in Norbert Wiener's book, Cybernetics or Control and Communications in the Animal and the Machine, MIT Press, 1948. Wiener used the term in reference to the control of complex systems, particularly self-regulating control systems, in the animal world and in mechanical networks. It's important that the term cyber does not necessarily have to be associated with things of a mechanical or robotic nature, as I'm sure people do now, you know, they think... They think cyberpunk, they think cybernetic, and they think, you know, some sort of robotic modification. Actually, it can just refer to systems in general, you know, organic systems. By 1960, doctors were researching surgical or mechanical augmentation of humans and animals to operate machinery in space, leading to the portmanteau cyborg for cybernetic organism. I think that's where a lot of our misconceptions of what the term cyber as a prefix might mean because we think of, you know, cyborg, for, for instance. In the 1960s, spare part surgery began with the development of gigantic heart-lung machines. Public discussion included the possibility of wiring amputees' nerve endings directly into machines. In 1963, Kit Peddler discussed with his wife, who was also a doctor, what would happen if a person had so many prostheses that they could no longer distinguish themselves between man and machine. He got the opportunity to develop this idea when, in 1966, after an appearance on the BBC science programs Tomorrow's World and Horizon, the BBC hired him to consult on the Doctor Who serial The War Machines 1966. That eventually led to him writing with Jerry Davis The Tenth Planet 1966 for Doctor Who. Peddler, influenced by the logic-driven trains from the Dan Dare comic strip, originally envisaged the Cybermen as space monks, but was persuaded by Davis to concentrate on his fears about the direction of spare part surgery. The Cybermen were originally imagined as human, but with plastic and metal prostheses. The Cybermen of the 10th planet still have human hands, and their facial structures are visible beneath the masks they wear, but over time they evolved into metallic, more fully mechanized designs. A variety of specialized forms of Cybermen have been shown, in particular cyber leaders and cyber controllers, with power to command other Cybermen. And now I'd like to jump over to... where is it? Here, we got the... I'd like to read out aloud about the um, the costumes of the, the Cybermen, because this is a really interesting behind-the-scenes history, I think. For the 10th planet, the original Cyberman costumes, including the handle shapes on their heads, were designed by Sandra Reed. The masks and one-piece body stockings were made from jersey fabric, with holes trimmed up with vinyl where the Cybermen eyes and mouths were. The actors' features were darkened to hide their faces. The fabric of the costumes were coloured in a faint blue so they could show up on black-and-white television cameras. Over the top of the stockings, the Cybermen wore polythene suits ribbed with metal wings, along with ep epaulettes made of metal and plastic piping. Their boots were short Wellington boots, painted silver. In a 2016 interview, Reed, by then going by the name Alexandra Tintinen, never sure to pronounce that precisely correctly, described the motivation behind her designs was, I had a planning meeting that I had to be at, and I had to just have a design drawing with me. My motivation was the clock on the wall. Although the script specified the Cybermen should keep their human hands, Reed wanted them to wear gloves. However, Reed mistakenly forgot she said she would make special gloves for the Cybermen until the first day in the studio. Instead, makeup designer Gillian James hastily added silver paint to the actor's human hands. The chest units and handles were built by Shawcraft of Uxbridge. The handles were adapted from lorry headlamps, while the chest units used a lot of clear plastic and had battery-powered flashing mechanisms. The handles were intended as the housing for wires that lit up the lamps, but in a test shot, the bulb exploded and the idea was dropped. Tynan explained in 2016, I indicated that there was going to be a chest unit there, but I didn't do any designs for them because I knew that the units were going to be a props thing. Producer Innes Lloyd's production team wished to update the Cybermen for the moon base and make them look more sophisticated and robotic. Sandra Reed designed new costumes for the serial. These were based on a one-piece silver jumpsuit made from final fabric, and the Cybermen were given gloves with free-fingered hands. Their boots were lace-up army boots painted silver. Fiberglass helmets and chest units made from aluminium were built by freelance prop makers Jack and John Lavelle. Silver tape was added around the eye and mouth area for emphasis, and on Reed's instruction, the levels added hydraulic joints consisting of tubing from a vacuum cleaner manufacturer and plastic practice golf balls. Costume designer Daphne Dare, consulting with Reed over the phone, took over midway through production of the moon base while Reed was recovering from surgery. 
Ironic, I suppose. Eight of these costumes were reused with slight repainting and additions for the Tomb of the Cybermen, Reed's final Doctor Who serial, and a new costume was built for the Cyber Controller of a red-domed cranium built that was intended to light up but lighting mechanism failed. And now reading a little bit about the voice. Early Cybermen had an unsettling singing song voice provided by Roy Skelton, constructed by placing the inflections of every word on the wrong syllables. In their first appearance, the effect of this was augmented by having a Cyberman abruptly open his mouth wide and keep it open without moving his tongue or lips, while the separately recorded voice would be playing, and then shut it quickly when the line was finished. Now that's enough of that. Although the cloth-like masks of the first Cybermen were soon replaced by a full helmet, sorry, I am being assimilated right now into a Cyberman. Assimilation is the wrong term. A similar physical effect, though it was heavily inspired slash stolen from this, basically. A similar physical effect involving the mouth hatch opening and then shutting when the line was finished was used until the wheel in space 1966 later the production team used special effects from its radiophonic workshop by adding first a mechanical larynx used by peter hawkins then a vocoder to modify speech to make it sound more artificial in later stories of the original series and in the audio plays two copies of the voice track were sampled and pitch shifted downwards by differing amounts and layered to produce the effect sometimes with the addition of a small amount of flanging from Revenge of the Cybermen to Silver Nemesis 1988, the actors provided the voices themselves using microphones and transmitters in the chest units. It's pretty cool. And I think we'll just end it here so we don't go over time and get this video blocked. Thanks again, my friends.